The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question, and I call the honourable member for Bruce. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd heard for some months in the lead-up to this debate how bad this bill was. I've been written to by my local community organisations, South East Community Links, Casey North Community Information and Support Service. The financial councillors have written to us. Choice Australia has been all over the media for months. But I have to say, having now spent a bit of time over the last couple of days having a look at the detail, I'm shocked that the government would introduce a piece of legislation this bad. It is truly appalling for Australian consumers. This bill scraps entirely the responsible lending laws that were introduced over a decade ago after the global financial crisis that protect Australian consumers from predatory lending. And astoundingly, for this government, they were dragged kicking and screaming into calling the Banking Royal Commission, but afterwards they at least said, well, we accept the recommendations. This bill breaks the recommendation one of the Royal Commission's report. The Royal Commission into Banking said, do not amend the responsible lending laws. They do not need to be amended. They're there for good reason. They provide stability in the financial system and protection for consumers. And yet this government has broken effectively that promise, and here they are trying to scrap these laws. It's instructive to look at who wants this bill. It's not a long list. The big banks want this bill, the finance industry want the bill, and the Australian Banking Association want the bill. That's about it. Why? So they can lend more money without checks and balances. It's that simple. It's instructive just to give a brief summary, though, of what the laws do. All they do is ask the banks to do a bit of work and check documents properly and put a responsibility on them to do so to protect consumers and, most especially, vulnerable consumers, of whom there are thousands in my electorate, and I'll get to that. They put the responsibility on lenders to meet the standards, to verify documents, to understand who they're lending to. That's it. Why is the government doing it? Because the big banks want them to. They want to lend people more money. That's it. They can't say that, though, can they? Because that wouldn't sound very good. They don't want to be caught doing what the big banks want. So they're pretending it's because of COVID. Yet again, just like the wage cuts that we debated last week, earlier this week, they're pretending because of COVID, well, we've got to do these awful things. They say there's a consumer credit squeeze that's threatening to derail the recovery. Apparently, according to the government, Australians can't get loans. They can't get credit. The only problem is that's patent nonsense. Well, just Stop for a minute and think about the macro picture, the context that this sits in. Under the Liberals, Australian household debt as a share of GDP in this country, as of last year, was 119.4 per cent. The 2020 assessment of our global position showed that that's the second highest of 41 countries in the world. That's the second highest already percentage of debt that households in Australia are bearing of 41 countries, as assessed by the Bank of International Settlements. That's the context in which this bill comes, trying to get households to borrow even more money, whether they can afford it or not. Right now, in the real economy in Australia, lending's up by 10 per cent. Auction clearance rates in Sydney are pushing north of 90 per cent. They skyrocketed back in Melbourne. House prices are booming. Consumer credit has never been easier to get. The government's claim that we have a credit squeeze just doesn't add up. And the statements and data by UBS Bank and some others members of the Banking Association and the other industry associations, they show limited to no evidence of any actual problem. When you have a look, though, I mean, that's who wants it, the banks, finance industry and the Banking Association. When you have a look at the range of people and organisations that have come out and said, do not do this, government, parliament, do not do this, do not pass this bill, aside from the banks, there's pretty much no one who supports it. Choice the peak consumer organisation. They're strongly opposed. They're worried that the relaxation of lending standards will let lenders off the hook, make more loans to unsuitable that are unsuitable for vulnerable borrowers. And then there's the consumer groups. 
Um, I said earlier, I, I'm lucky. My electorate is lucky to be served by a number of wonderful local organisations, some of them with funding from the federal government, ironically. They don't listen to the people they fund who do this day in, day out, the financial counsellors that sit there and help the most vulnerable in society who have got themselves into all sorts of messes, sometimes through bad choices, sometimes through life circumstances and sheer bad luck. Uh, they've sent around a survey that was done uh, by Financial Counselling Australia, and it's instructive just to have a look at this survey. It's been sent to all members. I haven't heard any of the government members actually even acknowledge these concerns. It's all tickety-boo. There's no problem. This is going to be terrific. Government speaker after government speaker, they're saying there's, there's pretty much a guarantee they're giving that no one's going to get themselves into trouble. I mean, what nonsense. The financial counsellors, the people who sit there at the coalface talking to Australians with financial difficulties, 97 per cent of financial counsellors said the responsible lending laws should remain—97 per cent. 94 per cent of financial counsellors either strongly agreed or agreed that responsible lending laws are an important part of consumer protection. Just about everyone, over 90 per cent, they use these responsible lending laws every day in communities across Australia—regional areas, city areas. Financial problems are not confined to disadvantaged areas. But they are concentrated in them, including my electorate, which on the statistics is one of the most socio-economically disadvantaged places in the country. There's a lot of people in temporary work, casual work, suffering from the government's wage cuts, cuts to penalty rates already, casualised work, insecure work. Real wages in this country since this government were elected have fallen in real terms. It's a shocking indictment on their so-called great economic management. Real wages have fallen. We're fifth last in the OECD for wage growth out of 37 countries. So this is the context in which these laws to allow people to borrow more money comes. Flat wages, growth, casualised work, insecure work. It's a recipe for disaster. It is truly life-destroying when people get themselves into serious financial difficulties. For a lot of people in my electorate, 20 bucks is a lot of money. That's the, that's the extent to which people budget, down to their last 20 bucks. 92 per cent of financial counsellors agreed that if the laws are repealed, they can expect to see many more clients with unaffordable debt. The majority of financial counsellors, 71 per cent, agreed that if the laws are repealed, this will actually hinder the economic recovery, because once people get themselves into financial trouble, they don't spend in the real economy. They spend every dollar of their income and everything they can scrape together servicing unaffordable debt. And irresponsible lending, of course, still occurs despite these laws. It's these laws which enable financial counsellors to actually argue the toss and get a fair go for people who've been treated appallingly by banks and financial institutions. I'll quote from a letter from Susan McGee, the CEO of the Casey North Community Information and Support Service. Our financial counselling team are regularly assisting clients who are overcommitted financially and experiencing severe financial and emotional distress as a result. Any reversal of these laws will further impact on workable outcomes for our clients and potentially leave them in a lifetime of debt with the risk of losing assets, including the family home or bankruptcy. The Royal Commission into Misconduct in the Banking, Superannuation and Financial Services industry quite clearly demonstrated the need to retain these laws. Just a few case studies. Uh, both of the local organisations have sent me case studies. All members have been sent case studies, um, the sort of real-world impacts that happens to people right across Australia. Melissa, in my electorate, is a 55-year-old woman. She fell prey to a scammer, a scammer who preyed on lonely and vulnerable women living alone. She ended up in $120,000 of debt. This had been financed over 12 months by the bank, more personal loans, more mortgage advances, repeated increases to her credit card limit. All the signs were there, with no checks by the bank whatsoever. The financial counsellor helped her take an ombudsman's complaint and they discovered and found there was a breach of the responsible lending laws. It saved her house. 55 years old, eight more years of working. If these laws were not there, Melissa would have lost her house and retired into utter poverty. John's a guy in the electorate who's close to homelessness. He was a job seeker. He went to his bank. He's living between you know, fortnightly job seeker payment to job seeker payment. He said, I need a $1,000 credit card. $1,000, I need that to help manage my cash flow. The bank said, no, you can only have $5,000. He said, I don't want $5,000, I want $1,000. Yeah, they said, don't worry about it, you can just spend the 1,000. Of course, with the pressures of life within six to 12 months, John's drowning in debt. $5,000 might not sound like a lot of money to people in this place. 
but it is a lot of money to people like John trying to exist, paycheck to paycheck. He's already close to homelessness. This was resolved. They wiped most of the debt and left it at a level that he could pay off, and it was only resolved due to the responsible lending laws. The other examples, a person who owns, whose only income is from a disability support pension was given a loan for a car where the payments leave them without money for food or utilities. These laws are scrapped. Where's the protection for ordinary Australians? I have the most multicultural council area in the whole of Australia. They'll be particularly harsh for culturally and linguistically diverse uh, people of, of those backgrounds with languages other than English being their primary language. Gamblers offered multiple $50,000 home loans within 12 months of each other with an unproven capacity to pay. A 72-year-old client given a 30-year home loan. It's these laws which protect Australians from this kind of predatory lending, and the government wants to scrap them. It's also instructive, though, when look, thinking about these kind of proposals to look at what the experts say. People who actually reflect on good regulation and credit regulation and whose job day in day out it is to look at the balance between credit and consumer protection. The academic criticism is clear. They say that relaxed consumer lending standards may lead to financial instability in the financial system or a debt crisis when interest rates rise. It's kind of like the peak irony, really, for this debate, though, that the Commonwealth Treasury's submission to the Royal Commission into the banks—this is not a, you know, what the government might call a do-gooder organisation, worried about vulnerable people. It's not financial counsellors. It's not Labor MPs sticking up for consumers. It's the Commonwealth Treasury's own submission, made less than three years ago, made in 2018, to the government's own Royal Commission. That submission noted that the responsible lending laws enhanced rather than detracted from macroeconomic outcomes. I'll just read a few quotes from the other experts. Eliza Wu, who's an associate professor of finance at the University of Sydney, said these reforms could sow the seeds of the next housing boom and the next debt crisis. Karen Cox, the CEO of the Financial Rights Legal Centre, said that watering down credit protections will leave individuals and families at severe risk of being pushed into credit arrangements that will hurt in the long term. As I said, the Treasury's own submission, the government's own economic adviser, said the laws enhance rather than detract from economic outcomes. So you've got consumer groups, you've got financial counsellors, you've got vulnerable Australians, you've got academics, you've even got the Treasury saying this is a dumb thing to do, government. Don't do this. You don't need to do this. Why are you doing this? Because you've invented a fake credit squeeze when all the data is pointed in the other direction. There's no problem getting credit in this country. There's no evidence that the government's put forward. They're just doing the bidding of the big banks. And just uh, the last, last couple of points I'd make. I mean, even when you look at the regime they're putting in, it's downright confusing and inefficient. Under the proposed changes, lending decisions will be regulated by APRA for authorised deposit-taking institutions, banks, using their existing power to set prudential standards. So what does that actually mean? Well, it means that APRA's current lending standards focus on prudential protections, i.e. ensuring the banks don't make lending decisions that destabilise the banking or financial system. That's what APRA does. That's their job. It's an important job. But APRA doesn't worry about consumers. That's not their job. Their job's to worry about the stability of the financial system. And yet the government's placing all their hopes and dreams that somehow vulnerable Australians will be protected from predatory lending on APRA. It's not a job that they have to do. And under the new uh, rules, the government's proposals, I hope they die in the Senate, consumer lending will be regulated by three separate sets of rules and two different regulators, depending on the particular nature of the credit provider and the credit contract. I mean, they're taking a simple, proven, effective system that was recommendation one in the Royal Commission, do not change these laws, and replacing it with a mishmash to suit their mates in the big banks. The very final thing I'll say. I was listening to the previous speaker, and I've heard it in the government's talking points. It's about small business, apparently, is it? They're scrapping the dominant purpose test. The current rules say if you go to the bank and you say, I want a loan, it's a little bit for me personally, a little bit for the small business, you have to pass the dominant purpose test and say the dominant purpose of this loan is what, what it will it'll be regulated by. But the government's going to get rid of that. Well, I say 
Our travel entitlements are governed by the dominant purpose test. If we're going somewhere that's predominantly for work, that's the standard we are held to and we hold ourselves to. So if it's good enough for us, why is it not good enough and it stood the test of time in consumer credit regulation? The government's on the wrong track with this. I hope that they see sense and change their mind, or if not, that this bill just dies in the Senate where it should. Thank you, Deputy Speaker.